Matthew chapter 11. We're picking up in Matthew 11 and uh, 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 verse uh, uh, verse 27. In this hot topic of the patience of the Lord. Matthew 11 verse 27 says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. No man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Now I want to talk on this area of uh, the relevance in respect to the patience of the Lord in our lives being dynamically productive. First of all, can we look at this, uh, at, the, at this area of the word of the Lord and the things of God when it comes to this area of it being uh, delivered unto us? If the Son... The Lord Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah from heaven, the Lord, who is the word of God, made man. If he says that all things are delivered unto him of the Father, how much more can we relate to the humanity of God's word expressive in the reality that the Lord himself as a man, Ben Adam, the son of man, himself could do nothing but what he's seen the Father reveal, can we not relate when it comes to the very things God is calling us to do in our life? How does the patience of the Lord, the Lord bear relevance in our lives in respect to these things? Well, how many know that patience has an element of season and time, and the reality of the patience of the Lord has ownership by God and it, 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 in its effect is it, 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 is its populated af, uh, efforts in in uh, its development upon our lives. You gotta hear what I mean. The patience of the Lord is greater than our ability to work at the excellence of God's dynamic calling, dynamic fruit in respect to its productivity in our life. The patience of the Lord communicates its possessiveness being of the Lord. And the reality of the patience of the Lord at work in us communicates us being of the receiving end to what the Lord is dynamically impressing in us when it comes to his, uh, uh, the effects of his patience at work in us. So here today we can see the Lord Jesus through the Messiah. He's expressing to us even what we see him doing as the expressed personhood of God. There is a receiving of the Son in respect to the very activity of his living. Which comes by means of virtue of the Father above. The Lord says all things are delivered unto me of my Father. So this means that everything we see done by, you know, the Adon, the right hand of God, the Adon Adonai, the Son of God, the Son of, of Man, the Messiah, everything we see Him doing is express replica of what Hashem, or the Lord God in heaven, our Father Avenu, what He's revealing to us through the express replica of His personhood being the right hand of God, being the Messiah. The Lord says, everything you see, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. Right? And so I want to go here in respect to uh, reflective, the reflectiveness of the Lord in respect to his patience at work in us. And it's dynamically important that we catch this. Because the ramifications of our calling, the ramifications of our obedience to God, in New Testament reality, which is a transformation, has its relevance rooted in the reality that it's God's grace within our life, upon our life, that gives us ability to effectively work, even the call, even the areas of our character being developed, even patience accomplishing the things in us where we are, in fact, entire, wanting nothing, is the grace of God upon our life and within our life, and us being of a receiving sense. Can we position ourselves in respect to what the Lord Jesus Yeshua is showing us? 
Why does he got to tell us all things are delivered unto him of, his, of the Father? Why? Why is he even saying this? Think about it. Why is he even telling us all things are delivered unto him of the Father? Why is he even showing us these things? Why is he communicating these things? He's letting us know that everything you see him do is expressive to what the Lord would have him to do as he is in fact the Son of God. So everything he's doing, even as the Word of God, expressive, the Word, who's same as God, is his Word. Everything we see of him is of a glory sense that's expressive. And what does this guy have to do with the patience of the Lord at work in you? Because there's some things in our life that we know we got to be about doing even in respect to our loving call uh, from God. But the reality is everything that God would have us to do, everything that the Lord would ha have relevant in, in our character even, is not by our good ability to pluck the fruit and, and make it relevant in our character even, but it's the Lord consuming us with His ability to the point where what He works within us, we become that reflective sense instrumentally in accordance to what he in fact is doing divinely within our you know within our our clay structured instrumentalism and if we learn to bring forth the breath of god then the melody becomes that by virtue where men will see our good deeds and bring honor to god because god's the one who's doing it and they're going to recognize it because the lord has his way of doing it and the lord says all things are delivered unto me of my father and I wanted to sort of go with that initial. Come with me to Colossians. Come on, we're going somewhere. You got to follow with me. You, you got to stay in tune. You're going to get it if you see it. Look at here in Colossians chapter one. We're on this area of of the um, of the patience of the Lord coming down on a landing when it comes to our intimate facets, even of uh, us. Sukkot. I learned that the sukkah is your personal your personal tent. How many know that that's dynamic? Right? How many know that you are the temple of the living God? You got like a you got like a twenty four seven feast of tabernacles all day twenty four seven throughout all the year, but it's red hot on the on the actual feast day. You have twenty four seven sukkah with the Lord. Your body is actually the temple of the living God. When you got faith in, in the Lord Jesus Yeshua, the Messiah, He makes your body a temple. And so, you know, and, he, and he's got areas in the temple that you got to learn with me, right? There's different sections in the temple that scriptures give us, not just so we can historically see it and, you know, and try to construct it in a natural way. Okay, I'm telling you, there, there's beauties in that. If, you, if Israel produces, you know, a physical uh, uh, temple that we can see, Dynamically, the wall is there, but the problem is when you start leaning into sacrificial systems and reestablishing these types of things, where the Lord lets us know there's new covenant uh, essence to where we are today, where we have virtue to being innocent before God through the blood of Jesus, the blood of Messiah, being the final sacrifice. If we understand these things uh, according to natural Israel, who even shows us these things in accordance to Scripture, that we've had for years and we understand these things, some of us know it even intensely, being born again, whether Jew or Gentile, with the fact that the Lord is, a, is the final sacrifice, you know, then we won't mess around and, and, and try to bring forth sacrifices for years, which we haven't been able to do, but yet we still have a righteousness that's been given to us because the Lord actually worked something in an expressive way, which gave us this stance with God where we have peace with Him. In reality, to our relationship. You might say, what's that got to do with the patience of the Lord? Try to listen. We're on the introduction. We're going, you're going to see this all together, even when, when it comes to your calling. And there's a sweat that's gonna, that you're going uh, to that, that escape from, which was really something that the Lord brought forth as a result of the curse and has delivered us from a sweat that that we could not even the most righteous man could never do but the lord alone could do when he worked the excellence of the areas when it comes to observance in our relationship with the lord colossians chapter one look at this colossians chapter one uh is what i want to sort of touch on slightly colossians chapter one and we're going to pick it up here in colossians one and we're going to grab it on uh, Colossians 1, and we'll, we'll pick it up in, uh, okay, yeah, for the sake of where we're heading. Colossians 1, verse 12. Colossians, prison epistle. Colossians, what a powerful uh, letter. 
Colossians chapter 1, this is a letter for, uh, which has been scribed by the scribe of, of Paul, who was an apostle, called by God, very revelatory. You know, he, he's an apostle of revelation, really, I would say. He's got dynamic um, when it comes to spiritual things, I guess would be better to say when it comes to that. Let's dive in. Colossians 1, verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. We're going somewhere. This terminology, meet, means to be on reconcilable terms. Me means to be of qualification aspect. That, that, that's what you get if you read it in context to the English structure. If you study the Greek uh, original wording, you may have to find it in respect to it, the context even, unless you have a good you know, Greek uh, 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 literal where you can read it in the sentence. Even if you're going to get it in Hebrew. You know, you got to put that Hebrew word in context to the sentence that been, that's been framed. And in the context of the sentence, he says, Giving thanks, which is really, uh, which is really a, project, a, a progressive of a thought that's preface it, it to where we are. Don't worry, we're going somewhere. We're really diving into something. Actually, you want to read the whole chapter to catch up where we are. But verse 12 is sort of like an injection. We're kind of diving in the midst of a thought that's progressive. He says, Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet... To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Hear this. In light. This is power. And we're going we're gonna to dive into this. Look at verse 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness. And hear this. Has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, we're going somewhere because I'm going to talk about the express image of, of his dear son. Which we know that we just read in Matthew 11. The Lord even himself said, you know. All things are delivered of me, of my Father. Remember how he said that? That lets you know that what you see is what you get. Glory talk firsthand is the Lord. That's powerful. Because the Lord said to my Lord, is what King David said in the Psalms, right? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. What's that mean? The the Yehovah, the, 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 the Yahweh, the Hashem said to my uh, Adon, is a good way of looking at it, the right hand of God. The Lord said to his right hand, sit while I make all your enemies, right? You can almost look at it that way. When you see the Lord, you see the Lord. I guess that's a good way of saying it, right? When you see the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, when you see the Lord, when you see Yeshua, whatever he does, you see the Lord. It express exact image. Right? So look at verse 13. Here, look what he says. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness, watch this, and has translated us. Into the kingdom of his dear son. Come on, you got to hear me because this is the patience at, of the Lord at work in us, making us entire. To be entire, even on our initial parts of relationship with God, is to have complete translation from darkness to light. And guess where it starts? Your spirit. Unless you're born again, you cannot even see a progressive of your soul, even your body, being translated. How many of you remember Star Trek? Can I, can I, can I, can I, listen, some of you are going to just rate this cut me right now. Like, how dare he bring in that, you know? Just listen, there's this thing they did in Star Trek where, you know, remember Scotty? This is like, you're going way back. Scotty's like, this is like, uh, you know, what's the guy with the ears and everything? Like, okay, you're like, uh, just, I'm not endorsing anything. All I'm saying is they had this thing called beat me up. Yeah, you're saying Spock, right? My mother's saying Spock. It's my mother's era. It's saying Spock, right? Captain Kirk, I think, was the captain that day. I like Captain Picard era, but anyway, so we're, we're going to get off of it. This is for those of you coming on, right? Listen, so the reality is like, okay, so uh, uh, Captain Kirk, he had this thing where he didn't flip the phone. He had the, he had the flip phone way back before we had the big old, like, I remember uh, Kirk Franklin did this video with, um, I think it was Mary Mary. Uh, 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 was it Mary Mary? Or Trinity 5-7? I can't remember. By God's grace, something like that, right? On the video, he, he's he literally, and he's not doing it to be funny. Ha! He has this cell phone. Matter of fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to find that video and put it in here on YouTube. He has a cell phone by his head, and it's a big old, like, <laughs> like he, he thinks he's being funny, but that's literally how the cell phone used to be. Like, this big, right? Well, even before, way before even that, Captain Kirk had the little cool, you know, little flip phone thing. This is like Star Trek, right? He had the flip phone thing talking about beam me up Scotty, right? Because Scotty was the one who was way up there in space with the, with the starship, 
And a prize. I don't know about all that. Okay, the word of God says flesh and blood shall not inherit, you know. Anyway, so he's wearing out face. What I'm saying, I don't, I don't know about all that. You know, should, should flesh and blood be traveling around? That's a whole other area. But we're on, we're on the topic of translation. I'm trying to show a picture of translation. Somebody, if somebody has forget, you know, you have forgiveness for me if I'm leaning on some stuff. We're in a gray zone. Captain Kirk flips the phone, talking about beat me up, Scotty, and they did this thing where they're complete. Spirit, soul, and body would would like become uh, 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 the DNA even of their life would, would go disappear here, and boom, they're in the ship. How many remember that, right? This was this type of travel where they were able to completely uh, consume your body. Well, I want you to know something. Even though this was secular TV, I don't even know if any of the producers had any faith in God. But I want you to know that scriptures tell us the Lord literally would do, was doing stuff like this. Remember Philip? Philip was an evangelist. He was elected because, uh, because the widows and the fatherless children in the church era, which was predominantly you know, uh, 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 Jewish, even before, I think, was this before Cornelius? No, it was, I think it was after Cornelius' house. God save, I'm pretty sure, right? Well, the reality was, you know, the Lord, uh, they elected seven because what happened was the church was getting so much people coming in and there was widows and fatherless children that they would have like these big open room feed everybody type of things where they would feed. The church was like, the church was, was doing it. Greater than even secular, uh, uh, like welfare systems, the church was doing it. Like literally, you lived in a city, and you connected with the church, and you were widows and fatherless, you knew you just connect with the church because you could get fed, everything. Well, they had all these widows and everything, and the apostles were the ones who were, who were delegating food and taking care of everybody, but it was sort of taxing them when it comes to their calling. Hear me. Their calling was, no, the Lord God wants the apostles to be consumed with the word of God and the ministry of his word and prayer. Believe me. Believe me, if you're not called to do it that way, that's okay, because you're not called to do it that way. But the responsibility of the apostles were, they better be consumed with the Word of God when it comes to the Word of God in respect to the ministry of it, as well as prayer. That's just the call of God of an apostle. A real apostle, they know, mess around and they spend not enough time in the Word of God that God's called them to. They're going to be ineffective, primarily for the people that they're called to care for. That's apostle talk. And even if you're a pastor... Teacher, evangelist, prophet, whatever. You have a unique, delegated time that the Lord wants you to be in the Word of God. But an apostle even has like, there's a serious... So what happened is we see this in the book of Acts where they're like, you know, it's not good that the apostles were taking too much time away from equipping God's people, the ministry of the Word of God, the prayer time they had to have committed to, that there came a, a need where we had, okay, we have to elect some people that can care for the widows and the fatherless children when it comes to naturally, practically caring. Which is very important as well. You better believe it. Right? Even to the point where some people would be like, you know, well, hey, they're not really, you know, they're not even really caring about the things of God if they're not doing that. That's okay, because you're called to be on fire that way. And while other, others of us are called to be on fire when it comes to just being consumed with the Word of God. When it comes to being consumed even with its love and pre preparation for the people of God to be effective and equipped and empowered. Even to the point where your spirit will be formed by some individuals that are called into your life that are officers, especially apostles. You may come in contact with an apostle who's an authentic called by God apostle. Right? I've had the honorable uh, delight of meeting some actual authentic apostles. I met some that were kind of fake out here. <laughs> right? They just wanted to, you know, they just wanted to see how much of, uh, of the wool they could floss on you, you know, and they want to show some kind of power that wasn't even power. It doesn't even matter what kind of feelings you got. And the real apostles, I've had a chance of meeting some real apostles, and it was dynamically exciting. Some real prophets I've met, real evangelists. I love you, you real evangelists, teachers I've met, some real teachers, they're unique. Show up late, you're done out here. But what, what am I going on? What am I saying? Because the reality is the Lord had to elect Seven people who would be consumed when it comes to this care area. You know what's so cool? He elects the seven people, and then all of a sudden this persecution comes that's so hot, everybody's scattered out here, right? 
And we're on scatter mode. And while we're on scatter mode, because of the crazy stuff that was going on, because I really believe that sometimes the Lord is like, you know, he wants us to do some stuff. And sometimes stuff will stir the nest, you know. We're like, if you don't get going here, you will face some stuff that will make you want to get up and go. It happened in my life. Really. We're on a topic. You got to hate it with me, right? It happened in my life. I met an elder who told me it took him 20 years to step into something God's been telling him that he wanted to do. He was called the pastor and do some work. It took him 20 years to finally get into it. And for the whole process of 20 years, the Lord was constantly telling him he had to make the move, make the move. And it wasn't until the climax of 20 years something happened where he stepped into it and he got the revelation that for the whole 20 years he could have stepped into it. 20 years? Mess around. That's a long time. That's like half of my life up in here plus a, a little bit plus a few going on. Right? So what am I saying? They had to elect seven people. So amongst these seven you had Stephen, or Stephen, who was a, one of the first martyrs when it comes to the degree of election. Because James, I believe, was martyred first before uh, St Stephen was martyred. A lot of people don't tell you that. Because he was a quiet apostle. He was quiet, but he was so hot. He was amongst Peter, James, and John. We learned from, from, from Paul's life that there were some apostles that were considered chiefly apostles. They were chiefly. Apostles of the Lamb, even scriptures let us know that these apostles are considered to be foundations in Jerus of the, the Jerusalem above. The mother of us all that's coming down from heaven. This blessed holy city that the Lord is preparing in the heavens is coming down. The temple of God, which the prophet Ezekiel gives us wisdom and insights to, where there's water surrounding it that, that no man could even dare to even tread. Even the prophet himself said he can go. He went to the waste deep period. Then he saw waters that were just way too consuming. This was speaks. To, this was the excellence of this third temple. The reality of this new Jerusalem that's coming down, decked with jewels, and the apostles of the Lamb, their foundational apostles. This is where you have these different sects of doctrinal conceptions, where they say things like, "Well, you know, there's no apostles today." Because they, they've already written scripture, that error is already done, and that's gone away. In reality, what they're saying is in respect to the apostles of the Lamb that are foundations of the New Jerusalem. If you're talking about apostles like Peter, James, and John, who walked and touched the Lord, and Paul being very much final when it comes to that type of an apostle, you're accurate. You're accurate. But to say there's no office of an apostle, you're inaccurate. They're here today. Apostles are here. Why am I saying this? There was an election of seven. And you had Stephen, Stephen, who got martyred out here. Man of God, he had such a revelation. you got to read it. He got such a revelation from the Lord in heaven where the Lord himself was standing. you got to understand, Isaiah saw him seated. And, it, and when you read it, you're like, wow, this is such a heavy-duty Stuff going on. What Isaiah talked about angels. The other day I was thinking about how God gave these angels literally like six wings. Because parts of their wings he designed so they could be close enough to him. But they were so close they literally had to cover their face and cover themselves. Above the mercy sight the seat flying around. Talking about holy, holy. Listen, sometimes you get in the word of God with some people that are just so open. You can get revelation where you're like, I, listen, I spent time uh, with one of my friends. When he was on fire for the Lord, we stayed up all night on one verse in Ecclesiastes till five in the morning. I showed up at his house at a job, one o'clock, and we were talking about a computer job that we were going to do. He's the one actually put me on. I was more production, music production, but I, you know, I needed work. He put me on a whole computer thing. I was at his house one o'clock in the morning. We found ourselves in the Word of God. He cracked open Ecclesiastes. We were in Ecclesiastes till four in the morning talking about, whoa, did you see this? And he was like, whoa, listen to this, but do you know this? And we were like doing it back and forth. I'm almost confident the angels are like, they're above the mercy seat flying around. And they got special wings that God gave them just so they could cover themselves and fly and not bang up into each other. Talking about holy, holy, kadoosh. Angels are saying this. Stuff is shaking. Isaiah's lips are quivering. He's talking about, man, I'm unclean, God. We don't even fall on his face up here. The angel shows up and touches his lips. Why am I saying all this stuff? Because even the revelation of Isaiah wasn't as intense as what St Stephen saw when he's getting stoned to death. 
and the heavens crack open and the Lord God Almighty shows up standing before the power of, uh, uh, you know, how can you word it? Hashem, I guess is a good way to word it. Yahweh, the power of the glory. You can't even see it, it's invisible. And he saw something so intense. He sees a son of man standing in the glory of God, so powerful that even the pain of his stoning did not compare to the revelation of what he saw, even to the point where he was like, Father, you know, just forgive them for what they're doing to me. You are tripping because he's dying. But this guy stoning him. The minute he said that, he was evaporated from his body, taken up. He was one of the seven. And then there's Philip. Philip was an evangelist. He's one of the seven that got elected. And so Philip, he's running down this chariot. He, he comes to this Ethiopian eunuch who's in the chariot reading Isaiah. And he's running beside the chariot under the order of the Lord who commissioned him. The Lord sent an angel, I believe, and said, go chase down that chariot. So Philip's running beside the chariot. And, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading. This is in the book of Acts. And it's in the Brit, Brit Hadashah book of Acts. This Ethiopian eunuch, he's reading Isaiah. Right? And so Philip's beside him running, and he's, and he's reading Isaiah. He hears him reading a portion of Isaiah. And immediately when he shows up to the chariot, he can hear. I don't know how this went down. But he can hear the Ethiopian reading parts of Isaiah. And Philip's like, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian's like, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? And how many know that that's put it in the scripture so we can get a revelation of the Spirit of the Lord, who Jesus Yeshua told us it's to our advantage that he goes away as a man because the Spirit is coming, the Comforter of God, and the power of Mashiach. God's going to pour out his Spirit upon us. And he's going to come in this personhood of Yeshua, the Spirit of the Lord, who's here today. And there's fire here today, if you listen carefully. There's fire. There's Holy Ghost in, in doom and with joy, if you listen carefully. So he tells him, do you understand? Because he hears him reading this messianic portion of Isaiah. And so the Ethiopian, in response, which I do believe was by the Spirit of the Lord, for us today as we're reading the context of the Scripture, we hear the Ethiopian say, how can I understand? Unless somebody guides me. So we get a revelation of the Spirit of the Lord that's coming to the expedient of the personhood of God, which was Messiah Yeshua as Son of Man, uh, physical, who ascended, pours out His Spirit. And so we have the Holy Ghost, the Ruach, the Ruach HaKadosh of God in the very ministry reality of Mashiach. The Spirit of God is with us with this dynamic endowment of Mashiach where you get Christ. Which talks about the anointed one and his anointing. Here he is. He shows up and the Lord says that he's coming to lead you and guide you into all truth. Here's the Ethiopian eunuch. He gives us a revelation because he says, how can I understand unless somebody guides me? So we got a revelation of the Spirit of the Lord who's going to give us an intimate guidance when it comes to the very scripture. The very word of God. We're going to have firsthand witness from the Mashiach of the Lord, who's all encompassed in the unification of Father and Son. The reality of the Spirit of God with us, like the breath consuming us in an upper room, like fire, like tongues of fire, giving us the express translation of God's Word. The Ethiopian eunuch breaks it down by simply saying, how can I understand Isaiah? Unless somebody guides me, so Philip takes the opportunity, and he does an accurate, so accurate was Philip's ability to communicate the gospel of Mashiach, Yeshua, Jesus to Christ, that the Ethiopian was practically begging him. Here's some water over here. Can you baptize me over here? And you can, uh, you can hear him almost like begging him to get in the water because he just knew by the Spirit's conviction. And Philip had the ability to articulate the gospel so good. This person was, how many of us are like practically, we're like begging someone to say a sinner's prayer up in here. That's okay, however, you know, however your moment is. When you have authentic, it's fire, right? But here you hear the Ethiopian practically begging him, this water here, what forbids me? And Philip was like, well, you know, do you really believe? <laughs> right, I love it. So they get down, they get into the water, go down into the water, got to get baptized. He does his baptism thing, and then something happens. To Philip, where the Spirit of God brings a, a massive a, a work, which God's Spirit, uh, listen, God will always do this. When it comes to Him accompanying the authentic Word of God in your mouth, in your life, you preach the gospel properly, He will always do signs and miraculous wonders that will back up a, an effective proclamation of His new covenant Word. Listen to me, I've seen bones constructed. 
I've seen people's mouths constructed. I've had the opportunity of people for, that had cancer, blood issues, organs that were, that were constructed in their life. That's working in miracles, by the way. And some of you got gifts and everything you come to the Lord that you don't even know about. Because you ain't coming to church, you ain't getting it, but we're, that's a whole other area. But the reality is something happened when Philip preached it. They went down in the water and the Ethiopian eunuch got baptized. The Lord zapped us because he took uh, Philip and he translated him where he just completely disappeared. In the eyes of the Ethiopian eunuch, the word of God says that the Lord translated him. Zoop, beat me up, zoop, boop, and put him somewhere else where he had to continue in his evangelical uh, journey, preaching the gospel. This is the real truth right up in here. It really is. And it happens. Today it happens. He translated him. And this is what it looks like. But listen, when the Lord translated Philip, how many know that it wasn't just a spiritual translation? He didn't just spiritually go from terrestrial to celestial, which we all do. How many know that when we get born again, we become citizens of heaven? Literally, something happens inside of you. It's a secret agent move. When you really meet God and the Spirit of the Lord is convincing you, come on, you've got to believe, and He's piercing you, piercing you. Your heart has an opportunity to come in so He can do that invisible surgery and circumcise your heart, and you get a new spirit that only God can give you through the power of the Holy One. You get born again. Spiritually, you become connected above, seated with the Mashiach above. But then, there's other parts of us that have to engage when it comes to this translation reality. And the motions of our other parts, which awaken to this translation reality, is process communication, patience of the Lord at working. Philip! His whole spirit, soul, and body was beating me up, <laughs> like, toof, disappeared, toof, reappeared in a whole other area. And it's not something that's not, uh, that's not actual, but it's something that is, that is authenticated through scriptures. We see it, right? So what does this have to do with Colossians 1? The Lord says in Colossians 1.13, in respect to the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, he says, he, in respect to him, he who has delivered us from the power of darkness... Speaking of the Lord God, He delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, through New Testament reality and the effects of the gospel of Mashiach Yeshua, Jesus the Christ. He has delivered us. He has translated us. How do you fit that into the terms of, of His name? Yeshua, the salvation of God. Translated us? Do you know salvation and deliverance is huge in, in respect to this term, translation? Hear what he says. He delivered us from the power of darkness. Now listen, it's important that we get literal on terms. Not only did he deliver us from the kingdom of darkness, but also he delivered us from the dominion of the kingdom of darkness. The dominion of it speaks of all the invisible powers, speaks of all the worldly secular powers, all those things, even sin in humanity has no dominion over us any longer. It's not just a good, come on, we're not just talking on a good religious, you know, uh, we're just religious thing on here. Everybody, you ready, ready? We're going to take up our offering now. You ready, ready, ready? <laughs> Listen, it's okay. I'll have to take it up. I'll tie the offering and just hold me to do. Some people, you know, they, they try to stir your emotions to make you give in some kind of way. Some people, they just do it as they're led by God. And when you actually act on it, then you start, you know, entering into some things where, you know, your financial areas are blessed. You're like, hey. Some people talk bad against tithes and offerings. They think as if the Lord was talking that way. But they don't read Hebrews. Hebrews says, here a mortal man receives it to, to bear witness that he ever lives. Speaking of our high priest being the Lord. But if you don't want that type of, you know, revelation, you go ahead and you know, get mad when they take up offering. But I'm saying sometimes it can be abused, right? But that's not our mission here tonight. You know, even though maybe sometimes we're suffering in that area because maybe we're not giving any wisdom in that area. Believe me, there's a place you can give so whatever. I'm talking about it lightly because it's an abused area. But the reality is the Lord in this term of translation also speaks of the dominion power of darkness. What's it got to do with the patience of the Lord at work in us? What's it got to do? Because don't you know the patience of the Lord at work in us has a ramification of shalom. 
where nothing missing, nothing lacking is in any area. Come on, if you could talk about being entire, like it says in James, we're going to go there, like we read earlier in another, in another message. If James says, you know, but let patience have a perfect work in you, that you may be entire, lacking nothing. How many of that, that has great uh, uh, relevance to shalom? The ever-increasing power of, of, of Shah Shalom. Who's Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, and the kingdom he has worked through his blood for us. So initially, when we kiss the sun and get into this commitment stage, when we experience the translating power of the Holy One, initially, it's power, uh, a power uh, um, translation that we first engage with. Power even for living. So much so that it says in James, uh, John chapter 1, as many as believed in him, he gave them the power. But the power word that's used in that sense is not so much the wonder-working miraculous aspect as much as the authority, God-given, ability, right. But you get this term of asusia in the Greek versus the term of dunamis in the Greek, which you know, if you bring it into a Hebrew context, not having it learned a good way to bring the word difference, but in reality, this power speaks more of an authority, a right in respect to your living right even. You know, like only a son has a certain amount of right in a house versus someone that's fixing the toilet. <laughs> Can we say it that way? You got a different type of d dominion up in here, right? You've been translated, delivered from the power of darkness, he says. And he has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Listen. There's some terminology. So first of all, he, 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 he removed us from being subjected to, you know, the God, uh, the little God, the idol, the little God, the demonic areas that are governing the air. They call this principalities of the air, where people's minds even unawaringly are serving the, the idol uh, of this world who gained access to the power of the air through the disobedience of Adam and Eve. God gave the power of the air to mankind. What's that mean? They were the highest dominion on earth until the fall. When the enemy saw the dominion and his craftiness, he took the dominion from man by means of man's consent. They took up the tree and ate it. And they became a fallen being in respect to what was governing, in respect to celestial, the first heaven. So these fallen angels came in, invaded through this deceitful work of the enemy, who gained access to the dominion of man to the point where the Lord himself had to be subjected to this reality of man's dominion. That's why he's called Son of Man, Messiah talk. But he was born... In a kingly sense, he was born according to uh, King David, I suppose, but he's the Lord from heaven, in reality. So he had dominion over human uh, subjection, being the Lord from heaven. He worked through his blood deliverance, condemned sin, stripped power of the enemy at the cross, through his submission to his own Torah, observ uh, observances to the peak perfection, without any sacrifices needed. He himself was the sacrifice that gave us the witness of this when he told Abraham even, in testing Abraham, excuse me, in proving Abraham, telling him, take your only miracle child, Isaac, Isaac, your only child, that's a deep area to talk, and sacrifice him. Was it Mount Moriah? And sacrifice him to me. That's what he said, right? Take your only son. How many of that just wasn't that wasn't just some random thing the Lord was doing? Oh, look, come on, we're gonna we're gonna test Abraham, see if he really got the faith that that we're, we're, we're seeing here. <laughs> come on, he's the Lord. He had a reason even in testing Abraham and taking his own son, and that's before any type of thing was scribed. Moses wasn't Moses wasn't even a a, a twinkle in, in a a a yoke a, a yoke, bit. Is that is that, what that I can't remember that, the name of his parents, but. Come on, this is Abraham talk, right? Way before angels even gave the, the excellence of Torah, you know, by the finger of the Lord to have things inscribed by Moses. Come on, way before Abraham was way before. And the Lord said to Abraham, take your only son and I want you to offer him up to me. Why? Just randomly? Because he was showing us something so powerful in respect to what the Lord alone was going to do, even in respect to tonight, what we're touching on, the dominion of sin. Even though we are born, hear this, we, hear this, we were shaped in iniquity, 
How, God, can you say that, you, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made and you knew us even before you fashioned us in the womb, in the matrix of our, of our mother? You know, how can you say these things when we know that the scriptures say we're shaped and formed in iniquity? You know, if you want to come into a good revelation of that, put your faith in the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah. Get born again. Because then you're going to begin to understand, hey, wait a minute. You're going to even crave for some eternal things affectionately that you don't, you're not even aware of it, but you just know that there's a bigger part of you. Scriptures say, put off the tent because God is, you know, you're groaning inside because you want to put off this tent because you know that there's a, a bigger reality to an eternal building of you even suka <laughs> right anyway you personally have a bigger engagement with god that sometimes you're groaning you want to know god at the place where he's calling you to know him so where you're at you get frustrated thinking that you don't know god at all some of you are like you know do i even know the lord because you're not where you're supposed to be in your revelation to your thoughts but the lord's tugging on you to seek him by giving you a desire for something that you don't even know you don't even understand the reality of it because you're, you're seeking the Lord for something that you haven't even pressed into, thinking that you, you need to be there because you're not satisfied where you're at. Don't you know that it's the Lord impressing us because he's calling us to seek his face in a, in a stronger way. So what's it got to do with the reality of this verse? Because these are evidences that the patience of the Lord is at work in you. And these are evidence that something even deeper in your invisible members has been impacted by genuine faith in the Messiah issue with Jesus who declared to us all things are delivered unto me. So verse 13 says, he who has delivered us, that's the Lord God in heaven, he who has delivered us, he delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Look at Colossians 1.14. In whom? Ha <laughs> ha! That's so power. Jew, Gentile, male, female, skip the barbarian up in here, whatever you got it going on. In whom? That's so powerful. The Lord becomes the household of God himself. In whom we have redemption. They might say, oh, come on, it's invested in his activity. Why are you talking about your life being in him? Don't you know that Mashiach, that Christ got to be in you? He sure does. But if you don't get baptized, let alone in water even, not even talking about the Spirit's baptism, which is the Lord Himself doing something that's so powerful. I can't even talk, talk on the area right now. Just so strong. And it's not a matter of, I think I'll have a baptism of the Holy Spirit. I think I will. I think I'll agree with the doctrine. I think I will. You're messing around with some stuff that is amazingly holy. Even where John the Baptist is, is prophesying to us. John the Baptist. The final prophet of old, of Tanakh era. When it comes to Tanakh being Old Testament, not Tanakh in, in reality of the fullness. Even Brit Hadashah kisses Tanakh and there's a fullness. You know, come on, you sons, we better connect with the fathers, fathers with the sons. Because, you know, I don't know if the Lord says he's going to break up with some plague stuff that the whole planet gets if we don't get to it. Some of us are working very hard on this area. 15, listen to what he says. Who is, who's that? In whom? Verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. Who's that? Obviously, come on, that's the Messiah issue with Jesus, right? He's breaking it down. Look at verse 16. Look at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven. Hear this. All things are created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether there be thrones, dominions. Come on, we're, we're Colossians 1.16. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's so red hot. What's that? That's speaking of the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, in his, in his, uh, in his um, preface uh, 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 revelation, which is being the word of God. When you read Colossians 1, which the, the Spirit of the Lord, you know, he, when, you, when, you, when you are a Talmudim and the Spirit of the Lord becomes your, our rabbi, doesn't matter, you know, what mouth is opening up when, in respect to the Word of God. When the Spirit of the Lord is the rabbi, it doesn't matter what mouth is opening up. When it comes to the Word of God, the Spirit of the Lord will take the Word of God and you will have impressed revelation by the Lord because you have submitted to Him as rabbi. 
And nobody's offended out here. Nobody who's authentic, Jew, natural, who comes into faith, will be any way offended by, by telling you you are absolutely right that the Lord is rabbi. I'm telling you now, there's many that are professing it and it's reality truth. And nothing is being stripped from any leader in Orthodox area or whatever that comes into the faith of the Brit Hadashah New Testament area. They're bringing revelation to us that yes, the Lord is in fact rabbi. And when you have this sense of discipleship that only God can give you, because you continue with the Lord and His Word abides in you. And then you know the Son who set you free indeed. You are entering into discipleship area. And listen what he says in verse 17. He is before all things. By Him all things consist. I love that word. Study it. It's like a framework reality in consistency. Okay, it's, it's, it's so dynamic. It's more than just consist, meaning ongoing. It has a framework terminology. Look at verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Ha, this is power talk. Some people camp on preeminence so strong that they get weirded out, you know. Oh, you know, the son, he was the son, you know, he was the son, you know, uh, he, he was born in heaven somewhere. What are you saying? He's the only begotten. You, don't you know he was born of, of the Virgin Miriam? Mary? Come on, talk real. He was the son of God when the word of God was made flesh. He put on a body for us. He put off a body. Even on the cross, he looked at Yochanan. He looked at John. He looked at Mary and said, woman, behold your son. But you know that there was a transition happening there because he's about to come off and go back to the glory that he had before the world was. One is the Lord God. Shema. Hear it. God is one. And the Son ascended. And when he's coming back, dripped in blood. Word of God up in here. In the power of the Father. This can be a dynamic moment. So here we are, verse 17 he says, He is before all things. By him all things consist. This is word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was the same as God. What's that mean? You are not in any way taking anything away from God by professing that when you have the Word of the Lord, you have the Word of the Lord, which is in fact the Word of the Lord. All things are delivered unto me by the Father. That's the Word of God. Put even in the mouth of some prophets of old who profess Him. That's the Word of the Lord. You got the authentic Word of the Lord, you have the Lord. Empowering your life with nothing of an unequal sense. Verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. That is his power. Preeminence means even above ranking. Preeminence speaks of an endearment that the Lord God alone should have in the hearts of men. One is a seat that should be in our heart, which should be established by the grace of God. It's good that the heart be established by this grace. That the Lord would fashion His mercy seat in the hearts of faithful covenant men and women. The Lord must have preeminence. And He gets so strong on this in the book of Revelation. He says, listen, I'm excited for you. You haven't denied my name. You're doing everything I even told you to do. You're finding out these false apostles out here. You guys are dynamic, but I got one thing against you. I love, the, I love the Lord. He said, there's one thing I have against you. You left your first love. You left the preeminence of your life, he says. Get back to me. Do the first things you were doing. Remember when I cut you? Remember what you were doing? How you were on fire for God? How many of you are talking like that? Well, you know, if I say, you know, are you on fire? Well, you know, I'm not like I used to be. Well, what were you doing with God? When you used to be. You think that the patience of the Lord at work in us means that, you know, you think as it says in Hebrews 6, you know, not laying again the foundational doctrines, let us move on. You think this has something to do with you forgetting your first works with God? I was thinking about this today. Actually, I believe the Lord from heaven was like, sometimes when you're ministering the word of God, God will teach you stuff in person while you're just driving or whatever. He'll just show up, mess your whole, you're thinking about something, okay, I got to pick up this food or whatever, and just bang, you just got this revelation while you're driving. Like, wow, God, I never thought of it like that. He's just taking the word of God and ministering to you. You just be minding your own business and the Lord will just show up from heaven and give you something to deliver on to you. Break bread with you from heaven in the spirit. Where well, I was driving, I was like, and I started getting enlightened by the reality of these foundational aspects of our life. And I was, it's almost like it was a conversation that was impressive, you know. 
It's like, okay, you think if somebody's building a house, it's okay, so I'll just talk in a paraphrase way. If somebody's building a house in Canada, in a lower income area, and the Lord says, okay, you know, I'm going to bless you, young man, or whatever, I'm going to bless you, because now you're going to build some houses over in Singapore. Listen to me. Singapore has some amazing, unique differences when it comes to their architectural design of construction engineering. They believe me, they might have some differences. You're like, how? What do you mean? Well, even in Toronto alone, mess around and go through Mississauga areas. Some areas you got some building that got like a, a strange type of curve, type of unique type of new type of deal. Like, I ain't even going up in that thing. It looks like if the wind hits it, we're just like, you know. But they're like, well, actually, you know, because of the construction, they, the way that they build this building, they've got like this internal loopy thing in a city. Really, they got these buildings that are like, man, like they just created this new thing. I think it was in China or something. It's like this highway that does this rival. It's like you're on a crazy type of uh, 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 roller coaster ride, but it's a highway that goes like in a spivel, like I mean, up thirty thousand in the air type of. I ain't driving on that. <laughs> Maybe they're getting us ready for flying airplane cars. I don't know. But what I got was whether you build a house in Lower Income, Canada, Ontario, up in here, Brooklyn, uh, New York, up in here, Singapore, whatever. The foundation has got to be the foundation. You can build a build, building that goes up in the sky rise with all type of loop de loop twisty too. But what you learned about foundational things, whether you move on in a progressive construction, you better not forget the elements of when you break the ground and you lay a plummet, cornerstone, whatever, that the foundation better be really good. And if you learn these foundational things, However the Lord takes the church even in our relationship with Him, doesn't matter where you go, culture, have you, whatever. There's some stuff that the Lord has placed in His Word that whether we move on in the race from the starting point, doesn't mean we leave all that learning in that sense, but we progressively move on in it. What's it got to do with the patience of the Lord at work in us? What's it got to do with preeminent talk or the exact express image being the Son of Glory Whose patience is bringing us to a place where we're entire in God. What is all this if we try to bring it in somehow? How does it work? Let's carry on. This is what it says in verse 19 of Colossians 1. This is prison epistle. I mean, know that Paul got a whole lot of time to think about what he's thinking about. <laughs> he's in prison. I'm not saying that the Lord put him there on purpose. But how many know that he's there? And I love the Lord because you, you think, Paul gets so red hot to say, you think what? You think these, these chains mean? These chains are, I, I, I'm a prisoner for Christ up in here. <laughs> I love Paul. Mess around. You find someone in the life where you can't even boil them alive. And even when, when you try to boil them alive, you still find something positive about the moment and preach to something. Okay, this is crazy. We're going to just banish John to an island up in there. We can't even boil him. <laughs> That's what they say, right? This is crazy. When you get so in love with the Lord, He makes it to where you got some friends, even they're so, like, they're so sick and tired because they, they wanted to be fake friends and, and you still ain't getting it. They try to kill you up in here and still you find a way to show love to them. Like, oh, I don't, I don't even know. We try to kill him even and he's still loving us. Yeah, this person definitely got some kind of parts that we got to investigate. This is the reality of red hot when the Lord's at work in you. Look what it says in verse 19 in Colossians 1. Come, you got to hear me. Paul is in prison. He's got a lot of time to think about what he's thinking about and writing down. 19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. In who? In the Son of the Lord God. In him, it says that the Father in heaven, the Father above, he was pleased, well pleased. Listen, we quote the scriptures of Isaiah where it says it pleased him to crush the Son, he, that he was bruised. It pleased him that he was bruised and crushed out here for our, for, our, for our peace. The Lord was crushed and bruised. And so we see these scriptures. There's another word where it talks about the Father who was well pleased. In reality, to these, these dynamic things in, re, in re, relevance to the Son, Mashiach, Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And this revelation he's given us about this expressiveness when it comes to the adone of the Lord being very much the Lord, but, revel, but revealing to us through his face the excellence of the Lord God who's invisible. 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. What's that mean? That speaks of the Lord God and His Godhead reality. Listen, if you're ever concerned about trying to figure out, you know, uh, this three-in-one terminology and all these things, listen, just call the name of Jesus. That's all you got to do. And the Lord God Himself will reveal to you the dynamics of when it comes to the, the Godhead revelations. 
When it comes to the Lord expressively revealing His Spirit to us, it's His Spirit even that searches the deep parts of us where we're groaning to have a further clothing of the Lord. We want to understand God even more. And we're seeking Him, not even on a physical stance, but our hearts are beating for parts of Him that we don't even know were there to be attainable. But the Lord's calling us deeper in, in our love walk with Him. That's patience at work in you and I. It really is. It's deeper than just circumstance and, and ramifications, even of character development. Seeking the Lord is patience of the Lord at work in us. So we can enter into the divine parts of our inheritance, which is the, the Lord. There's no greater climax to genuine faith in God than when the Lord manifests himself to us. And we have moments where we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And this comes through our consumption of His Son. Look at verse, uh, uh, verse 20. Listen. And having made peace through His blood of His cross, by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself, by Him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. This is so powerful. So ultimately, it's the Lord God above who was working this reconciliation even at the point of the, of, the, of the intensities of what the Lord Jesus, Messiah Yeshua, did for us in His physical sense, shedding His blood, dying on the cross. You know how intensely gruesome. It was so powerful that, that some even translated, the, there's certain parts that where the Father looked away. And you know, you hear, you hear the Lord Jesus, Messiah Yeshua, saying some things which are intense even beyond the understandings of a Hebrew tongue. Eloi, Eloi, lama, lama sabachthani, right? This is intense because some even said, you know, he's calling out for Elijah. These weren't, these weren't Gentiles that said that. These were Hebrew-tongued dispersa. Hebrew-tongued Jews who were with him that said, he is calling for Elijah. Because they heard Elo, Elohi, uh, what is it? Elohi, Elohi, or something along those lines. Lama sabachthani. And it's even captured in, um, in, in uh, our English translations, to the point where I think one man of God, I can't remember who it was, I think, I'm pretty sure who, who it was, I just don't want to say in case I was wrong, who even said that he was speaking in, a, in an unknown tongue on the cross. Really, that he was actually speaking in a, in a spirit tongue, saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it's only the Spirit of the Lord that gave us that expressive translation. Oh yeah, you better study it, come on, go to the Gospels, right? Some say he was actually speaking in tongues, for those of you who think that there's no such thing as stammering lips or whatever, right? It's, it's all reality. So here we are in Colossians 1 to continue on with what it says here. Verse, uh, 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 verse 20, uh, 21. And you that were sometime alienated, enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has, has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death. This is powerful. In the body of his flesh? So who's talking here? And he's talking about in the body of his flesh as if he's of a different means than his flesh. Come on. You've got to believe that the Lord became flesh or you are moved by an antichrist spirit. That's what John the Beloved said. If you don't believe, you know, that the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah came in the flesh, where did he come from? <laughs> right? Come on, you got to study the word. In the body of his flesh through death, through this, to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight. That's so powerful. He put on human flesh so that we could be presented in His sight. What's that speak of? That speaks of Kohen Gadol. Come on. We're on the topic. Am I saying that right? Kohen Gadol, high priest, right? I can't Was it the woman of God? Someone was saying that, you know, that Israel doesn't have a high priest. Who's lying to you? The Lord God came, shed his blood, rose from the dead, ascended in front of 500 Jews. Natural Israel watched him ascend with their mouths dropped. God had to send angels. And this isn't just made up, you know, stuff. This really happened in Israel. He ascended in front of everybody. And there's scriptures that verify this, preface it, prophetic scriptures. He ascended in front of everybody. Angels showed up saying, why are you guys standing here? <laughs> right? The reality is the same Lord put on flesh, dwelt among us, and fulfilled something so dynamic. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, what's going to happen? You are going to be presented by the Kohen Gadol, the very high priest of heaven, 
who's according to Melchizedek, who came and showed up out of nowhere in Abraham's life after he just, you know, clocked 12 kings because they took Lot. Abraham wouldn't even have got involved in this stuff. But he heard that they took Lot. I think he mustered up 300 people. Is that right? This is, this is Torah, by the way, right? You got to go there and read it to get the exact express. He, like, he ended up mustering like 300 of his servants or something like that. I'm pretty sure. I can't remember the number. And they went out there and they killed. They, they didn't kill, but they helped. Like they, 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 what are they? they spoiled 12 kings. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah came out here talking about how he wanted to give uh, 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 Abraham some money for the awesome warfare he made. Abraham was just going out there because he heard that they, they took his nephew Lot. He's like, what? You know, these 12 kings took who? Lot, who he took with him, who God didn't even tell him to take, but he just took him because he loved him, probably is what you kind of read between the lines, because his dad was dead. Remember, that's, his, that's the son of his dad who died, who was his brother. So he takes his son, Lot, on this journey where God calls Abraham out of, uh, you know, he was Ab Abram at the time, before God changed his name to Abraham, father of, uh, of, na of many nations, right? So Abraham, he hears he's got Lot, so Abraham musters up 300 of his servants, and he straight up did 12 kings, right? 12 kings, and all their men were fighting. Abraham came in there and just silenced everybody, got Lot, see, so you came out of here and housed the enemy of these 12 kings, housed them to the point where the king of Sodom and Gomorrah came out. But just before, I'm, I'm almost confident when you read it, just before the king of Sodom came up to try to put some stuff into Abraham's life, the Lord has this mysterious individual out of nowhere just show up. Is this Melchizedek? Out of nowhere. And what's his prof prof profession to Abram? He's like, he, uh, was it Abraham at the time? I can't remember. His profession was, blessed is the Lord God, possessor of heaven and earth, who has blessed you in respect to Abraham. And Abraham's response was, was what? The very first intensity of the tithe. Comes from Abraham. What is this? So Abraham takes a tithe of all he possessed from this warfare where he delivered a lot. He takes this tithe uh, reality and it's instituted. And how is it instituted? By recognizing the king and priest of the Most High God, who was Melchizedek. So according to this dynamic, mysterious moment, the Lord comes in the flesh, delivers us as Messiah, as a suffering servant. Delivers us from sins, suffering a, 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 a corruption in our life. And he exalts the Lord. The Spirit of God raises up the Son where he's one again in the heavens with the Father. The one that they had before the world was Ichad. One God. And he raises them up where he's one. You see the Lord? You see the Lord? The Lord puts Moses in the cleft. I love talking like this because, you know, he puts him in the cleft, covers him with a hand. And the glory of, 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 of Shem. Yahweh, you know, the content is that we don't have the vows to bring the excellence of the name. The mysterious realities invested in the Adon of God. He covers his hand. He passes by saying, the Lord, the Lord. And that's the Lord who's saying this. What's he passing? This is power. Right hand of God, power. And the same Lord comes as a baby in the womb. He lives a life and he delivers us with his blood. He crushes the enemy at, at the cross. The greatest moment you think is the most shameful that any man can have. Stripped and beaten like no man. Ripped apart so we can have virtue for our healing in the body. He put on this body for us. The Lord from heaven put on righteousness. He ascends and he is seated as the only mediator between God and man. Who is the Lord? And all throughout scriptures you can see the Lord is mediating for us. When he shows up as a man, it's the Lord. The express image of God is the Lord when He shows up as a man. He does amazing things for us, even usually before a great deliverance is happening. All throughout the scriptures, the Tanakh, read it, Old Testament, you can see the Lord showed up as a man. Amazing stuff going on. The Lord shows up. And here we see the Lord today. Isaiah gives us glimpses into this. He's seated. Why is He seated? He's seated according to this reality of Melchizedek. He's seated as king and priest, high priest. Listen, Israel, you have high priest right now, the Lord. He's high priest right now. What he did in Aaron, the revelation to us uh, when it comes to natural things, he himself has satisfied and is seated in heaven as our high priest. Scriptures say we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Lord intercedes with us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Don't you know? It was the groanings which cannot be uttered that the Lord heard from Israel. 
when they were in Egypt, he heard these unexpressed groanings. For real. They were so, so deep, God could hear it. Don't you know the Lord heard the groanings of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. She, he heard her while she was even persecuted. Because she's at the temple, her lips were moving. You may not think it's persecution, but it was. When Eli showed up talking about woman, everybody's there. Eli says, woman, are you drunk in the temple? Because she had such a groaning. Her lips were moving, but the Lord heard her groaning and made her barren womb open up so she could conceive. The Lord in, in, enters into the womb of Mary. Don't you know, the topic is the patience of the Lord at work in us. So what's the intensities of where we're going here? This body, the things that the Lord has established, the unique power, these ex the excellence of His priesthood even, invested. The reality of it is, when we show up before Him, when we leave this body, this tent, we put it off. And the Lord is even transforming our bodies to be translated into the kingdom of His Son, where He makes our tent bodies become a celestial spirit body, which is a mystery, at the sound of a trumpet, the twinkling of an eye, these things are going to take place where the bodies are going to resurrect from the ground and we're going to climax with our spiritual realities being absent from the body, present from the Lord, coming in the clouds. Our physical bodies are going to awaken and be, but the ones who went before us will precede us. How's that possible? Their bodies are going to awaken to this. The graves are going to crack open. Even in the scriptures it said when the Lord put off his body, on the cross, you read the scriptures, it says graves opened up. You ever read that? Graves opened up! Why, God? Because there was a translation from paradise, the bosom of Abraham, to present with the Lord. This was even worked in our translating power. And this is even worked when the patience of God is at work in you. And what bears evidence that the patience of God is at work in you is when your faith is tempted. What's the temptation of your faith? This is red hot area. Unbelief, doubt, striking you, sins uh, 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 of, of, of passionate means, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, afflicting your faith. Where sometimes you feel, you feel, you feel the absence of the Lord in respect to your faith area. Patience. Is that working you? You ever had a moment where you're like, oh, Lord, you know, is this thing going to happen? You know, do I even believe in you really? Am I really in here? You know, right? This is an awesome opportunity because patience is at work. You ever see some stuff in your life where the Lord shows you? Look at this area of your life and you see it. It's got red hot magnification. You're like, oh, man, why am I acting like this? God. So you try to get in the Word a bit more. You try to include a little bit more worship time. You try to include some more time, you know, in the presence of God. Because you figure that if you just put good effort, you may produce the fruit that you need in your character. So you're just trying so hard. <laughs> right? And you just keep failing more. Why? Because patience of the Lord is at work at you. And the Lord says, come on, you got to let her have her way. I love it. He refers to the patience of the Lord as her, right? And he gives us little glimpses. Come on, set your affections on things above. How, God? Really? I'm hidden with you in the kingdom eternal, but I'm over here walking as a man? Is this stuff real? <laughs> right? But when you spend time with the Lord, the real God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he begins to unload this stuff inside of you where your heart is beating. You just can't help but tell it all. And it's expressed through our living when patience, the patience of God is working on areas. Primarily, it's the internal areas of our life. Even so red hot, the Lord says, I do nothing but what I see the Father do. All things are delivered unto me. No man knows the Father but the Son. And this is reality in respect to the intensity of our life. Let's keep going around. I don't know. We're, we're not dragging on. You got to follow. There's no dragging up in here. Verse 24 says, who now? Okay, where is it here? Uh, where is it? Uh, we're going to skip down a little bit here. Where is it here? We're going we're gonna to go down to, uh, well, you know, if I go in here, this may be, it may be strength, the strength of what I'm saying. I want to go here, but if I try to read all of this, you know, it might be a little bit too long uh, in respect to where, where I want to go here. So let's, let's just skip a bit. I encourage you, come on, you got to read this, uh, uh, the book of Colossians. It's real small, not a big reading. Read it out in context to where we're going. And let's just skip a bit because I want to, I want to bring us to this area that I think is dynamically relevant to where we are here tonight, and then we'll come down for a landing. 
and sort of and sort of uh, conclude there. Okay, so we're in Colossians. I want to skip a few verses, and we're going to come over here to uh, this terminology of um, of expressiveness when it comes to the Lord and His mysterious uh, 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 relevance to being e having the equality of God. The equality of God is so uh, prevalent when it comes to the understandings that we need to carry, even in respect to knowing the Lord as the Godhead, when it comes to final decision area, when it comes to Him making terminologies like, let us make man. Uh, chapter 2 of Colossians, when it comes to the uh, patience of God at work in us, when it comes to the Lord saying, all things are delivered unto me by the Father. When it comes to the Lord, you know, lifting up his eyes in John 17 saying, you know, make us one, the oneness that we had before the world was. Lord, you know, and he calls up to heaven, he says, Father, that they may be one in us, that they may have the same oneness that we have in us. This is intensities. Uh, Colossians 2, I mean, I want to find the expressiveness of what I'm communicating. And I think it's around here, uh, uh, chapter 2 area. Uh, I think it's like chapter two, closing part area. Maybe if we just dive in, and I think if we look sort of, I think that it'd be the strength of chapter two, I think would be good. Chapter two, maybe if we dive in uh, 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 to, uh, uh, we'll come down a bit, maybe like, okay, we'll just dive in. Uh, chapter two, I'm going to conclude this area. I'll find it a little bit deeper. I'll study it, look at it a bit more than we come on. Maybe I'll give it that way or I encourage you, read the book of Colossians. Colossians 1, uh, 2, chapter 2, and we'll pick it up in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If you hear anybody bring this terminology, terminology of three persons being of God, I think that it's more expressively best. I'm saying this carefully because some people have a good revelation when they express it that way. But if you're not careful, people will perceive God as three Literal, it's, uh, 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 what is it called? They use the terminology. You'll see God as three literal people. And you'll miss the relevance of, you know, the Spirit of the Lord. The fact that the Lord God is one. His Son is, in fact, the personhood of God. When you read Colossians 2, verse 9, if you want to have a good expressive, not based on traditional uh, Christian things that were projected through a Catholic um, understanding... It, where you say things like, well, you know, God, there's, God uh, is three people. This type of terminology is not scripturally given. Although if you study it in respect to historically, you can understand, okay, I understand what they're saying, that, that, that bears truth. But if you want the express truth of who the Lord expresses himself as, then if you touch on people of God, or, you know, three persons, there's one personhood in respect to Godhead. There's one spirit in respect to Godhead. That's the spirit of the Lord. And the personhood of God is expressly given in Colossians uh, 2 verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the personhood of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's why he's called the Son of God. He's the personhood. Totality. He's not part of God. He's fully God, fully man, the personhood. You see the Lord, you see the Lord, the personhood of God. That's a good way to express it. I think that's why uh, John says things like, you know, if any man says that Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah is the Son of God, God will dwell in you. But if you don't say it, you know, in respect to Revelation, come on, we got to confess the Lordship of the Lord. But only the Spirit of the Lord can give you this understanding where you're saying the Lord, you know, where He is in fact the Lord in respect to your proper confession. It's only by the Spirit of the Lord that you can say this. You know, there's a time in my life where I ran around and to people saying, come on, say Jesus is Lord. Say Jesus is Lord. Because I had this thought that if they say Jesus is Lord, then, then God, you know, then they're going to know who God is. Because you can only say Jesus is Lord if the Spirit of the Lord makes you say it. <laughs> right? So I was misunderstanding. But the reality is the personhood of God, the Godhead bodily, you have the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, is the Messiah. He is the fullness Fully God, fully man, put on a body, dwelt among us. Same one who put the face, hand over of Moses. Same one when he showed up with two of the angels and Abraham was easily ready, even with zeal. He said, hey, come on, we got to prepare something. And he was able to identify who was the Lord amongst the three. That's Hezekim up in here. Hezekim did it. Good gospel, hip hop, uh, 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 ministers, uh, lyricists of, of the word of God. They did an excellent piece on this in a song they did. 
uh, what was it called? The, um, theophanies, I think they called it. What a power. Be powerful. I love it when people get in the Word of God and they use their gifts and their talents. It doesn't matter what field you're in. And you authenticate your love for the Lord with your gifts. Don't ever stop. It doesn't matter if you're pushing 50 out here. That means we're waiting for some of you, right? New stuff, come on. So uh, Colossians 2, we're carrying on. Verse 10 says, And you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. That speaks of high priest. Invested in Ben Elohim, the Lord who put on flesh the Word of God, who's the same as God. He he did not consider it. Um, uh, he did not consider it robbery. Even that's the scripture I was looking for. I don't know if it's Colossians or Philippians, where it says he did not consider it robbery to be professed as equal with God. He's the express image, the express image. Yeah, we were created in the image of the Lord of God. But the express image is the Word of God. Who put on flesh and dwelt among us. It's red hot. He's not a word in the mouth of a prophet. Like, like the prophet? It's not talking about a prophet that's showing up that's just, you know, mega. That's false prophet, by the way. You better watch because he's coming. There's all types of antichrist spirit in the earth, but it's not even, it's not even close here. I used to sense this stuff trying to creep. It ain't even creeping here. Something happened today. God just like obliterated something that was going on in a wrong way. And he'll do that in your life. He'll let you suffer for a bit so you can identify. How many of you know that you got, some of you got the gift of discerning of spirits? And you just don't even know it. You're able to discern the spirit of an individual. You're able to discern a little bit stronger the spirit of an atmosphere. You got this gift, but you know, it's not perfected. Some of you, right? So you're just running around here. I was talking about the other day. You're like, you know, sometimes I can feel what people are feeling. You sure can. Yeah, you got some gift going on, right? You're baptizing the spirit of the Lord, you know? Even before he baptized you, you had little inklings, you know, some stuff going on where the Lord was there. Even before you're insane, some of you had some little uh, inklings on the gift, you know, and some of you just, you know, gave yourself over to some demonic crazy stuff. And you think you're doing, you know, because you're like reading people's minds and all this crazy stuff. But you got a little bit of a gift, but you got some demon influence that the more you do it, now you get some strange pain and stuff going on in you. Because you're using it. Some are using it in legal ways. Some of you got like office in government and you're leaning on some stuff. They got some doctors out here that don't give a care about people. I don't know who, where you're at. I'm not saying it specifically. But some of, you, some of them are like wizards up in here. And they're psychiatrists. They're evil counselors that are raised up. Pro read the prophets. It tells you. Evil counselors. Even talking stuff on God. But in an evil, subtle spirit. Don't you know the enemy? He tries to present himself as an angel of light. So come on. We got to be wise to what's authentic the Lord and the Messiah. Is working on us internally and externally. You know, like, we're going to come down to practical. The Lord says, all things are delivered unto me of the Father. Why did he say this? He's in a human body. Why is he telling us? Does he just want to inform us? <laughs> okay, why are you, is he informing us? It's more than informing us. There's a deeper relevance to this. That the Lord is showing us. Come on, can you hear the scriptures? Come on, let's, let's, get, let's get real. Can you hear the scriptures in the book of Hebrews? Where it says, He's not a high priest that has not been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The Lord from heaven made a decision. He made a decision to visit Moses with a burning bush. That was burning, but was not consumed. Burning bush? Could it, I mean, what if that, what if that bush was like a wild olive tree, <laughs> right? This wild bush of an olive tree. I don't know. I mean, you know, you're speculating. But he took a burning bush that was burning that wasn't consumed. And Moses took a second look. And the minute Moses took a second look, the Lord called him by name. Why? Why did God wait for Moses to take a second look at this burning bush, which was really a setup because God was red hot about delivering Israel because he could hear the groaning. Such groaning that was like generational groaning. And he's like, okay, it's come up to my ears now. I'm going to do something about this. And he pulls on Moses, right? And a burning bush. Spare the moment. You think? It's been a plan throughout the ages. Same thing for you and I. Patience is at work in us. And however the Lord is reaching you and I, it's a setup saying to God, He's reaching you and I, and sometimes we find ourselves in these moments where you're like, is God, listen, when you have the sensations of, is God even still here? You are red hot engaging with the patience of the Holy One. Whenever you get feelings like, you know, I think, oh, do I, what, you know, I feel like God even abandoned me. 
you may go through this because you know what? That is that is sort of first of all, it's a lying thought, but the reality is it's you are red hot in process where the patience of the Lord is working in areas of you that you didn't even know, undetectable areas that God is bringing to the forefront of your sensory areas where you're like, what is going on? I didn't even know that was in me. The Lord is like, did I not give you an example when I purify silver, let alone purify gold? Doesn't it need the furnace? Don't you see the furnace with this burning torch while Abraham was sleeping? The Lord was cutting covenant with all humanity while Abraham was sleeping. (laughs) And these two elements pass through these divided animals that Abraham cut, although he did not do it to the dove. I think there's a few animals and birds that he didn't do it to. The birds came down eating the covenant pieces. Oh, man. There's a lot that was going on here. Why? Why? Because God literally cut a covenant with himself for us. A covenant that's irrefutable, that rests on the immutability of the eternal true and loving, li- loving almighty God who's Everlasting love, loving kindness is his throne, the mercies of God. Powerful things to think on. And the same one we meet when he shows up and presents us to himself before the eternal parts of heaven. Can you hear it? Open up, you everlasting gates. In case some of you wrestle with that thought, God gave it to us way back in Psalms. Open up, you everlasting doors, and the King of Glory is going to come. And who is this King of Glory? The Lord, strong, isn't it, right? The Lord of hosts, strong and mighty, right? The King of Glory is going to enter in. And it's through the righteousness of the King of Glory, the same one who's working in us by his, by his patience, where, we, where he hits us with degrees. Come on. You want to finish your course of life? You want to talk about your dream, your destiny, and all this stuff? Come on. You want to get red hot? Let's get red hot. Where we set our affections on things above. Because setting your affection has, has, has a lot to do with desire, and destiny and calling. Guess what? Your calling ain't about you know what you're doing here. Bless God that we need to know some stuff about practical. Thank God for the you know the, the mighty elders in that that are investing in practical areas. That's good. But ultimately, ultimately, sometimes God will just smash your whole idea of smart goal with eight steps and mess it up. And He gave us Joseph as an example, so we can see that even Joseph talked about after I'm dead. And you get up out of here, take my bones. <laughs> That's red hot. Joseph was already there, ring on his hand, second in command, feeding nations, with his brothers even in front of him, scared, talking about, oh, yo, what's going to happen now that dad's gone? Is Joseph going to kill us a bit, <laughs> All right? What you meant for evil, God meant for good. By the way, when you get up out of here, take my bones, get up out of here. What do you mean? Come on, we're, we're, we're in the land with the rich... Get up out of here. What do you know, Joseph? Get up out of here. Take my bones with you. What does this mean? This speaks of this excellent reality of God's patience at work at you, even when it comes to eternal resting places. Can you see the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, saying all things are delivered? He didn't just say all things are given unto me by the Father. He did say that in some areas. But here... He said, deliver unto me. Ooh, yeah. That was red hot. Deliver. What's the difference? Somebody educate us. Okay, educate us. What's the difference between giving unto me and deliver? Look at everyone you know and give my word. I'm here. I haven't slept in two days. I haven't left this office. I am here working on your behalf, letting the people of Israel know Christians and Jews around the world love you. You are not alone.